started today. Abba Father, in Yeshua's name, in your Holy Spirit, thank you so much for this day. And Lord, we know that all things are in your control, and Lord, we praise you for that. And Lord, we ask that you open our hearts and minds to your living word today. Holy Spirit, be our rabbi. Show us something we haven't seen. Give us understanding and empower us to live it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, it is good to see y'all today. Uh, as you well know, last week was the conclusion of the fall festival season and tabernacles, which is the most joyous time of the year in God's calendar, uh, was completed last Saturday. And we want to look at a little bit more deeply into what Christ did and what Christ said during a particular time of tabernacles. Uh, these are some themes we've touched on before, but my prayer is that we could bring them into a more cohesive whole, that you could see the picture in Scripture uh, from God's perspective, but also what that means for us right now. So let's just get into that. In Zechariah 14, 8 through 9, we see a prophecy. On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, which is the Dead Sea, and half of them to the western sea, which is the Mediterranean. They shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. So through Zechariah, God made a profound messianic statement about the coming king. And this would prove to be tied to his feast of booze. Now John picks up in John 7, 2 and 10. Now the Jews' feast of booze was at hand. His brothers had gone up to the feast. Then he, being Jesus, also went up, not publicly, but in private. Now, one of the things that we can gain from this is we can know that God is always working his perfect plan among us. However, he's often setting up his next move without our awareness of what he's doing. Yeshua was following his father's guidance and coming to the Feast of Booths behind the scenes. He was coming incognito. He was there, but people weren't aware of it yet. But God was preparing his son to make a major revelation about himself. Now, just a little sidestep there. In your life right now, you can know for a fact that Christ is with you. You can also know that he is setting up God's purposes for your life. He's setting up things. He's arranging things. He's present. He's doing it right now, even though you're not aware of it. And that's how it was in this time, because Christ was in Jerusalem, but he kept it on the down low. People weren't aware that he was there. He was preparing himself and being prepared to say something, teach something most profound. And that's true in our lives right now. With all the chaos, with all the noise, with all the stuff that's happening, the enemy would have you look at that, listen to that. But what we need to know is that Christ is the coming king. He's already here in his spirit. He is working his perfect plan in your life, in our lives, in his world. And he will reveal himself and he will reveal that at the proper time. And he fulfilled the word. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began teaching, John 7, 14. Now, as God had given Moses the command to place a special emphasis on the Torah, the instruction, every seventh Sukkot, and we see this command in Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 11, Yeshua was now fulfilling this word himself by merging in the middle of the Feast of Booths and teaching God's instructions to his children. So we see this prophecy and this purpose being fulfilled fully in Christ, which is what he did in everything. Well, the Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me, John 7, 15 through 16. So Jesus exhibited an astounding understanding and insight into the Torah of God from his childhood. And we see that in Luke 2, 46 through 47, when he's 12 years old, he's in Jerusalem, and he's talking among uh, the religious teachers, the leaders, and he's expounding on the Torah, and they're blown away by his understanding of the scriptures. So he revealed that this was because he lived in deep, unbroken intimacy with his father and his Holy Spirit. Thus, he was teaching what he had been taught by his heavenly father, not the doctrines and opinions of men. Now, 
when it says, how does this man have learning without having never studied? That's not saying that Christ didn't study the scriptures. It's not saying he didn't read over the scriptures and think through them and pray through them. What they're saying is he didn't go to seminary. He didn't go to the prestigious schools, if you will. He didn't follow one of the great rabbis. So where did he get this? And he's explaining, well, it's not that I don't study the scripture because he did, but I got this from my father through intimacy with him. But soul surrender, and he went on to say in verse 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether this teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. And again, we talk about the word know in Greek is the word ginosko, and it means to come to know, to gain a knowledge of, to perceive, to feel, to understand. And it's used for intimacy between a husband and a wife. It's really knowing someone or something very well, very intimately, very deeply, very powerfully. That's what he's saying. If your will is to do God's will, if you want what God wants, he, then you will know. You'll have an intimacy. You'll understand when you hear something, you'll know this is the truth and this is not the truth. And that's how we can test truth today. What we're hearing in the waves and all around us, if you know Yeshua, you know Jesus intimately, if you know the scriptures, you compare what you're hearing against that, you can know the difference. It's not that difficult, really, if you have intimacy with him. So Yeshua taught that for those who have the desire of soul to do God's will on earth, they are the ones who will have the knowledge, the confirmation, the confidence, and the understanding that he is truly speaking for his Father, and they'll live accordingly. Well, John 7, 37 through 38, this is what's so profound about God's timing. Remember, his timing is perfect. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, what's so profound about Christ's timing of making this statement, not that the statement in and of itself isn't profound, but he's doing this in the midst of a great picture among God's people. Because on this day, the priest descended from the temple through the water gate in the wall down to the spring called Shiloach, and it, that means resting by the king's garden. And they were obtaining living water, moving water. Living water was necessary for uh, sacred use. And living water is water that moves. They couldn't get it from a well or a cistern. It had to be water that had motion. And that, that represents life. There's movement in that water. And so for something, water to be used for sacred purposes, it had to be obtained from a moving source, a living source. And so that's why the priests would descend from the temple. They would go down to the Shiloh Spring. They would attain this living water, and then they would return to the temple. And this was a joyful ceremony. They would joyfully bring the water to the temple for the water ceremony. And then the high priest would pour out the water libation from a golden pitcher while the people sang Psalm 118, 25 through 26. And while this was occurring, now this, this is the picture in Jerusalem among God's people. This is what's happening in this moment. While this was occurring, Christ stood up and cried out that he is the source of true living water. Talk about a kabam. God's timing is perfect. Well, Let's look at what this really means for us from a standpoint of unpacking it for our lives and our hearts and our souls. And let's go back now into the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, Psalm 42, 1. As a deer pants for flowing streams, living water, so pants my soul for you, O God. So the psalmist points to the deep longing in the human soul to experience the flow, the living waters of God's presence. And this longing beckons to what was lost to humanity in the Garden of Eden. So what Christ is saying on that day, on the final day of tabernacles and talking about living water, goes all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to the roots, the core, when Adam and Eve were created. And there's a free-flowing river. A river flowed out of Eden, a dan, and that literally means delight or pleasure, a garden of delight or pleasure, to water the garden, and there it divided and it became four rivers, and that's Genesis 2.10. Float is the word yatsa, 
and it means to come or go forth with purpose or for result. So these rivers went forth with purpose and result in the earth. So when all things were perfect in the world, a river flowed, flowed freely and it watered paradise. From there, it divided into four, and four is the number for the earth. So it watered the earth and four rivers and spread its life-giving moisture outward. But tragically, the constant free flow from God was lost to humanity because of the sin of broken intimacy with God. What messed all this up? What, what ruined paradise? Sin, broken intimacy. Christ said, I came to restore that intimacy. If you have intimacy with God, then you're going to know if my words are coming from him. If you do not, you will not. But I have come that living water would flow, but it's going to flow through you. You're going to be that vessel. We'll get at that. Well, just real quickly, these four rivers mentioned in scripture are the Pishon, and that means free flowing, a great diffusion, it means increase, the Gihon, which means bursting forth or gushing, and also the Hidekal, and it's also called the Tigris, and it depends on which translation you have. It's about 50-50 in English. Uh, some use uh, Tigris, but that's from the Septuagint, but they both mean active or rapid. And then Euphrates means sweet or fruitful. So when you put all of these together and the meaning of this, the flow of God is free. It's increasing, gushing, rapid, and always produces sweet fruit. Well, there's a flowing land, Exodus 3.8. I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So God's deliverance through Moses was to free his covenant people from the bondage of slavery and release them into a good, broad, and flowing land. So that what was lost in Eden, Abba is in the process of restoring step by step, little by little. And he's building toward the moment when his son would come, his son would be revealed. And Yeshua on that last day of tabernacle said, I am that source of living water. I'm the restoration of what was lost in Eden. Well, in Deuteronomy 11, 4, when we're out of covenant and what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued after you and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. So the flow of God is a blessing only to those who are in covenant relationship with him, right relationship. If you're out of proper relationship, you can't survive his flow. See, the flow of God is a blessing to his children. When we're in Jesus Christ, when his flow comes, it's a blessing to us. It's life to us. It's power. It's authority. It's all those things. But if we're in wrong relationship with God, if we're out of covenant with him, when his flow comes, it, it overwhelms and destroys us, actually. And there's nothing in the middle. Well, vessels are required, and that's what Christ is getting at when he's speaking. And we see this all the way back in 2 Kings 4, 6. And it's the, it's the miracle of the oil and the vessels. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. In Proverbs 4, 23, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. So if we're to experience the blessing of the flow of God's spirit, then we must remain as willing and open vessels to him. And that's what Christ is saying, that if there's going to be a continued flow, you have to be an open vessel. And as long as you're open to him, he can flow into you and then flow through you and out of you. But there has to be a vessel there available. We see flow from the rock in Psalm 105, 41. He opened the rock and water gushed out and it flowed through the desert like a river. In Isaiah 48, 12, they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. And of course, Christ is that rock. 
and all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, 4. So the Apostle Paul is pulling all that together, and the, the natural experience that they had in the wilderness, in the desert, where water literally was flowing from a rock, and they were able to drink from that and live, Paul is pulling all that and saying, the rock is Christ. It was a type for him. And so living water flows from him. And when we're an open vessel, we can receive that living water. It can flow into us and overflow out of us. And it waters everything around us. Well, in Christ, like Christ. So he made streams come out from the rock and cause waters to flow down like rivers. Psalm 78, 16. Nehemiah 9, 15. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. And Yeshua is the source of the flow of living water. When we're in him, his flow comes through us to possess and bless the earth. And that's what he's doing now. Remember, he's restoring the earth. He's bringing life to the earth. God does not have a problem with the earth. The earth didn't sin. Man and woman did. And so he's in the process of restoring the earth. And he's in the process of advancing his kingdom and taking the land back. And he is doing it, and he will do it, and he'll have all of it. Psalm 2. So in us, through us, we are his vessels. Then he flows through us, and he begins to water his earth and he brings life, and he brings restoration, and the earth begins to produce fruit. Now, not just the physical earth, but the spiritual earth, the people around us, because we're his garden. And the flow from the throne in Ezekiel 47, 12, and on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves will be for healing. And we're talking spiritually here, supernaturally here. And we're those trees. Remember, we see in scripture how uh, the Lord uses the metaphor of trees to speak about his people of the olive tree. And he uses this imagery uh, to point to us. And so we will always produce fruit in Christ. There'll be, never be a time when we're not. There'll never be a season when we're not producing fruit in him. And it, it's for spiritual food and it's for healing for the people, for us first, of course, and then for those around us. So because Yeshua is our access to the very throne of God, and we see that in Hebrews 8, 1, the flow from God's sanctuary is always available and it's ever increasing, actually. There, there's no end to it. It just continues to flow. And the effect in the earth, Amos 5, 24, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Amos 9, 13, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountain shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. Isaiah 2, 2, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. It shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. So that's the effect of the flow of God's living waters in the earth. And we see in Revelation 22, 1, full restoration. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So the final book of the Bible reveals that in Jesus Christ, the river of life is completely restored in God's perfect creation. Remember, that's what was lost in the Garden of Eden. Christ is the restoration of that. So everything will be as it should be, as he intended it. The entire earth will once again live in the free flow of God's presence, never to be lost again. And that's what Jesus was saying on the day that he stood up at the Feast of Tabernacles. Abba, Father, in Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name, in your Holy Spirit, Lord, we praise you. We thank you for this truth. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Yeshua, that you are that living water and you were willing to come among us and you paid the ultimate price that this would be made true in our lives.
and you are that source of living water. Lord, our desire today is to be an open vessel to you. And Lord, all we have to do is just simply say yes, remove the lid, if you will, from our souls. That's all we can do. We can't create this. We can't maintain it. We can't sustain it. That's all you. You're, you're the source of living water. You are the living water. You're the flow. And Holy Spirit, you are the, 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 the instrument of that flow. You are the presence of the flow of Christ in our lives. So all we can offer you, Lord, is our yes. We could just simply remove the lid from our vessel, our soul, and say, yes, Lord, come in, flow through me. But Lord, as long as we stay in a position of yes, of just constant surrender to you, agreeing with you, allowing you to be God over our lives and through our lives, then Lord, there's no end to the living water that will flow through us as your willing vessels. And Lord, we thank you for that. That, that is beyond our comprehension. But we praise you for that today. And so Lord, we ask in Christ's name that your living water would flow through us like never before. Lord, everywhere we go in you and with you, Lord, that your presence would just simply flow into and through us as that living water, that river from the throne. Lord, everything you touch around us would come back to life. Everything around us would be restored. Lord, that is our privilege. That is our joy. That is our desire today. Lord, may this word at Tabernacles be fulfilled in our lives now and forevermore. In Christ's name and by his Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.